uh, I'll uh, just quickly, very quickly introduce our uh, five panelists here so that we can get into the discussion and then we'll uh, have a discussion for about an hour between them and then we'll open the floor for uh, a round of open sort of uh, discussions. Uh, so I'll just, I'll start with uh, Alan Lavelle, uh, who is walking up to the front. Uh, so Alan is uh, uh, part of our uh, team uh, working on this project, looking at uh, resettlements and relocations in various areas. And he's leading the work from uh, Latin American uh, uh, context. Uh, and they're focusing on uh, Peru, Colombia, and uh, Mexico. Uh, Alan is uh, also the recent uh, 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 awardee for the prestigious Sasakawa Award, which is given to lifetime uh, contributions to disaster risk area. Uh, so it's it's a great pleasure to have him here uh, for the last couple of days and also just now in this, this evening. Um, then we have with us uh, uh, Karen Kolho. <laughs> Can you open it? Okay. Um, Karen is uh, an, uh, a professor at MIDS at Chennai, and she's also working with us on similar questions and looking at uh, larger humanitarian questions as well as uh, other uh, other aspects of flood-related uh, consequences in Chennai. She's uh, otherwise, uh, of course, uh, by profession, she is uh, an anthropologist. Uh, and she'll probably bring in those aspects today in that in this discussion. Um, let me then call upon uh, Anant. Um, Anant Mariganti, he's the director at Hyderabad Urban Labs and has always been uh, forcing us to think outside our bounds. Uh, and uh, he will continue to do so this evening. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Kamal Kishore here, uh, who is uh, currently a member at the National Disaster Management Authority, and he's also been working on various aspects of post-disaster recovery all across all, all, all across the world. Uh, Arumar, he's uh, of course our director; doesn't require any uh, <laughs> introductions. In this space, uh, he will be moderating the discussion. So I'm just, I'm not going to take too much space here uh, and let them all begin. And rather varied day and a half from different parts of the world. Um, so I guess we're going to try and look at things both from a well, actually not, I shouldn't say both, from, an, from, a, from a global and or international perspective, stuff that's happening within India at the moment, and also some somewhat, I would say, abstract questions, uh, which help us try and reflect on how we frame things. And since a lot of the challenges around risk and resettlement are about how categories are set up and how they're navigated by various you know, interest groups, including the state, um, also look at that. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a back and forth discussion. Uh, I think based on the last couple of days, my colleagues here have sort of looked at some core reflections and questions that they'd like to deal with. But before we go into the kind of questions that, uh, or the responses that, that they've drawn from the session, I thought I'd try and outline two or three things. Uh, because this place is complex, it's very diverse. And I guess one of the challenges for us is to try and identify or understand what elements of that diversity we actually play with. Uh, the volume is kind of going a little back and forth. So, yeah. Um, the first, of course, it's fairly obvious, and urban is on one side of the spectrum, is the rural urban transition. And I think that's fairly important because the question of resettlement and relocation is both from rural to urban areas, and as we've seen in some cases, from you know, urban areas to some areas that are sort of peri-urban and rural. So there's a transition on both sides, there's a transgression on both sides, which is not so easy to define. So one is that, and that's, you know, we, we can explore that a little bit. That's not the primary focus. We're going to be looking significantly at urban areas. 
the second thing uh, the second sort of uh, continuum uh, is what I would call the risk continuum and by, by that I do not mean intensity of risk that of course is there in any case, but going from everyday risk the stuff that inhabits most of our lives and certainly the lives of poor people on a daily basis it is from you know fires to diarrheal episodes uh, you know to being evicted uh, or having a crisis of losing a job. So, starting at that end really everyday incidents which dominate the life of poor and vulnerable people and they are actually quite remarkable because they, you know they, they happen to be very very resilient to those processes starting from that all the way up to the dramatic charismatic uh, one in a thousand year event. So, whether it is a tsunami or whatever it is super cyclones are going to become more intense. So, I would not say super cyclone as a so, the, so it, it that is a entire risk continuum that is there that starts from everyday risk uh, and goes to things that then get reported somewhere in the middle uh, you know buses falling over roads and stuff like that. So, a large number moderate number of people getting killed to large things that actually appear and then are declared various forms of national disasters, national catastrophes or very large international incidents where the international system. So, that is that is another sort of spectrum that I think we need to, to explore because depending on on where you sit on that there are various forms of displacement and displacement does not always have to be movement of place. There could be displacement in the social domain, there could be displacement on the economic side which you see very very strongly. Uh, there is also physical displacement eventually in fact many of those processes only where they accumulate over a considerable period of time lead to a physical displacement yeah at, at some end. Um, and then you know um, the, the other sort of co the core thing there is the the act or the continuum from being settled in a place to being completely mobile. The extreme of being completely mobile is you know people who are let us say part of the global uh, sort of service economy. Uh, the worst example of those are, are, are people let us say in, in the finance sector who spend their life running from one financial center to the other that is one extreme. But the other extreme uh, is, is people in, in this country who are just not or many parts of the world actually who are just not mobile at all. So, effectively if you look at either men or certainly women they will more or less live and die in the same you know few few tens of square kilometers so that is one end of it that is changing very dramatically. So, the question of what displacement is in that process where the agency and uh, you know process lies as far as that is concerned. So, obviously migration is somewhere in, in between there are many value laden sort of uh, orientations towards migration in some in some senses migration actually could be uh, at one level a coping behavior and that is how it is often constructed, but it could be a search for dramatic new opportunities uh, and we discussed yesterday also that risk and opportunity uh, very often come together. So, that is one continuum also that that is quite strong from being very settled uh, and then the question of being uprooted from that place losing senses of identity of economic activity of social uh, you know whatever it is to actually being quite quite mobile. And in some senses uh, both the development and the modernization project sort of impose certain directionality to that to that continuum. And I think we need to interrogate that and the question then is who decides that direction is it decided by the state and do you use eminent domain for that is, is that decided by people who are doing it because they require I mean they want you know they want a life of their own let us say because they are uh, deeply underprivileged economic or otherwise and they move to other locations to find other things or is it because they are uh, let us say hazards that force them to do that uh, which they would not want to do otherwise. So, I would say those are three different continuum that may be actually useful to to to, to examine. Uh, the continuum of disaster risk or, or, or risk, uh, the continuum of, of rural to urban and then uh, the continuum of place and, and actually being situated in place. Because it is it's, it's in, in the interconnection of the inter <coughs> or the interweave between those that the question of resettlement and rehabilitation and who does what where and you know what is equal and unequal actually plays itself out. So, I mean for, for, for whatever that is worth because in a lot of the work that we have done we found that it is a very complex fabric and it does need to be situated and the answers are typically very local. But on the other hand when you are talking about systematic bureaucratic processes or public responses or even legal frameworks by the nature of them they have to generalize. So, the nature of how those categories are defined actually become uh, a deep problem in terms of how things actually play themselves out. 
So I guess, uh, you know, to I'd probably start with Alan and, you know, one of the questions that Alan is trying to, trying to, to engage with is uh, what are the limits to resettlement? You know, when does it become, I mean, I guess he can speak to that better than I can. When does it become an, uh, an instrument of oppression? When does it become an instrument of change? It, is that, you know, is that change building on uh, or is it substituting for something else? So, you know, your, your sort of broad thoughts on that thing would be actually quite interesting. Um, well, I guess what, what have we got, like five minutes each or anything you like? Okay. Well, let's um, and, uh, put before that question, the very question of motives, goals associated with the, the broad notion of resettlement. And there we fully realize that populations historically have been mobile on an individual or a collective level. Um, the U.S. history, for instance, was made up of the conquest of the frontier. That was a very big thing in the history of the occupation of territory in the United States for settlement process going west and in many other places. And so that's a common feature of human, humans and human beings which has increased um, over time under diverse manifestations. Um, what we're dealing with here is particularly movement and settlement and resettlement associated with a thing we're calling risk. And that risk, as um, Aromar has just pointed out, can be seen on a continuum from what we can call everyday risk through to what we've been dealing with particularly, which is disaster risk. That is, risk associated with the occurrence of particularly um, potentially damaging physical events of diverse nature. Um, but we know that resettlement can be associated with risk expressed, for instance, in terms of conflict situations in rural conditions, like in Colombia, which I know well because of the work we've been doing there, where there's civil conflict between armed guerrilla groups and um, government, and local populations move to protect themselves and resettle in urban areas, um, and many others. But what we're basically dealing with is um, the notion of resettlement under conditions of environmental stress. And that environmental stress can be associated with what can be seen to be regular, small, medium or large scale physical events like earthquakes, um, hurricanes, um, flooding. And it can be now associated with changes induced by climate, which can be anything from an exaggeration or amplification of what have been traditional hazard risks through to the creation of new risks like changing climate averages which in fact make it unsustainable for population to live in areas where they produced maize, maize before or whatever and therefore they're obliged to move not because of an extreme event but because their climate has changed to such an extent that their livelihood has become unsustainable and so what we're dealing with here in particular is with the idea of resettlement under environmental stresses exaggerated by climate change or not. And particularly we've been looking at hydrometeorological phenomena from drought, flooding, hurricanes, etc. No? And so what we first have to realize, I think, which is a conditioning factor, is that we're resettling or search to resettle or people search to resettle. This can be spontaneous, organized or planned, etc. Due to what you could consider to be an error of origin. That is, they should not have been there probably in a large number of cases in the first place. And so when we talk about resettlement, basically we're talking about a corrective measure that is trying to throw back time and allow people to be in positions of greater security, having been, for diverse reasons, located in areas subject to previously identifiable hazards. Climate change will change that, but most people we're looking at are located in areas that are subject to hazards that existed. And why are they there? And this is the big complication with resettlement. They're there precisely because they were suffering quotidian, everyday, or chronic risk 
as human beings in their normal existence. And so they were obliged to, and this is a, a shortening of a very complex um, um, question, they have been obliged to locate in what are hazard prone areas because they cannot get into the formal urban land market under more secure conditions. And so from the very beginning of settlement, and here we have to realize that populations that have resettled have once settled spontaneously in areas subject to hazard. And that, um, that, that location has been, in fact, related to their everyday quotidian risk factors. And so when we talk about why resettlement, the, the motive for resettlement is, in fact, to move people spontaneously or in organized fashion out of areas that even previously should not have been occupied. So resettlement is, in the end, a response to a non-resolved previous problem. And I make this point particularly because unless we are able to avoid in the future this continuous location of people in hazard-prone areas, the whole problem of resettlement will become, it is out of hand now, but it will become even more out of hand in the future. So the question to me is not how we can make resettlement better. The primary question is how can we avoid having to resettle in the future. And that means increasing governance on an urban level, the thing of urban land, bank, um, um, urban land that is available for occupation by more disadvantaged groups, etc. And I say this deliberately because resettlement cannot be a solution to too many things when it's seen from that particular angle. Um, it's a, it is like disaster risk management seen in a corrective fashion but it is, a, it, is, it is a struggle against time. You know, if we were to try to reduce all the disaster risk which exists in the world today, it would cost us our national budgets to do it. So we're inevitably faced with the idea of disaster in the future, and this is not a dramatic statement. Disasters will continue to exist because so much risk has been built up historically that there is no real feasible way because of the non-existence of, of economic resources to get on top of it. So, so the motives are motives of peddling back in time and trying to put people into more secure conditions. Now, the principal motive here is, of course, with resettlement within a disaster risk management um, framework, the principal motivation is to get people out of harm's way from this sum of hazards. But we know in wanting to do that, what we're doing is moving populations or attempting to move populations that live under the conditions of everyday quotidian risk. But those people under quotidian uh, uh, and everyday risk have, over periods of 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, relatively recently in general, built up livelihoods and ways of resilience when faced with stress from these environmental factors over time. So we built up livelihoods in places that are subject to environmental stress. And that is part of their lifestyle. So when we're moving them, we're moving them out of harm's way, but we have to move them in such a way that they can maintain to a minimum standard the levels of existence and livelihood that they have. And so the big question comes is, how can, and I'll stop here just for a moment, how can we, use what is an instrument of disaster risk management or an instrument of land use planning or an instrument of environmental planning because resettlement can be seen to be any one of all of these depending on who decides to stimulate it and at what moment they decide to stimulate it post-impact or pre-impact. How can we actually combine these two goals which are not implicit in the goal of resettlement to get people out of harm's way is to maintain and improve lifestyles and living conditions and livelihoods in the area where you move people to afterwards. And that brings us to a very important question with this, which is what are the minimum conditions to be able to judge that resettlement is successful? You know, if you're a minimalist, you would say that the minimum conditions for resettlement to be seen to be successful, and this is independent of the way we evaluate resettlement afterwards. If we were to look at the original objections, you'd say the minimal condition was getting them out of people's harm's way and maintaining minimally the living conditions or the lifestyle conditions that they had in the original location. And that sounds very negative. 
but that is the minimum. But the question of how you can use resettlement, in fact, to improve people's lifestyles and use resettlement as a development and transformational development um, instrument is the very big challenge, which isn't implicit in the goal of getting people out of harm's way, but because of a circumstance of the people that need to be resettled or attempt to resettle, it's an inevitable question. And so, to me, what is in, in question, I've questioned this many times, you know, I've asked myself why, for instance, when we look at re, um, 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 reconstruction post-disaster, why would sh should we think that reconstruction post-disaster could change the order of structural factors which have led to poverty and adversity prior to the disaster, why should reconstruction be able to do it if you haven't changed the way in which society's re reigns uh, are led? So why should resettlement be a means of improving people's ways of life if we haven't changed the structure of power and demand in society? So I'll leave it at that to start with and um, then carry on. Yeah, just to pick up from that um, and then maybe take it over to Kamal. Um, the challenge that we have, at least in a, in, in a country like, like, like India, is you have extremely large populations. Not only do you have extremely large populations, you have extremely large populations of poor people who are living in a highly stratified and I would say risk concentrated environment. Um, so, irrespective of where they currently were or currently are, they actually carry that, that, that risk w with them. It's part of their everyday lives. So, whether the act of moving them from one location to the other or the act of actually transforming their livelihoods is going to help reduce that risk or improve their level of development or their ability or their opportunities is, 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 in, is in some senses uh, the, the, the core question. Uh, just by moving somebody out of harm's way for a particular point of time, uh, whether it's an evacuation or physically moving them into another location may not actually solve the range of risks that they're exposed to. Because the risk of loss of life, in some cases people will choose uh, to, to, you know, you've seen this in so many places that you're trying to run an evacuation after a cyclone and there's an old lady that's holding on to a goat because the goat is effectively the rest of her life and all the livelihood they have. And she's willing to take the risk of being half drowned or being whatever it is because the other risks overturn uh, the short term risk of, of loss of life. And of course the trade off that we have just now is at least in, in our environment slowly the risk of loss of life is declining a little bit and Orissa is a classic example you know 15 years ago there were a lot of people who died now because things are becoming better on the mitigation side and, and early warning things are reducing. So the shift is now moving into the economic domain uh, and often it's about the act of being able to control and manage wealth and resources. Uh, so, you know, a piece of land that may be productive, a house that may be all your assets you have. Uh, moving away from that actually is, is removing people from not only their social and economic environment, but their potential for development in, in some senses. So, that, that's I guess, you know, part of the, the, the core challenge there. That, the, I mean, operationally, when we look at things after a, a disaster event, uh, very often, the larger long term factors actually do not actually play. You are looking at the immediate, you are looking at dealing with uh, human suffering in the short run and a lot of media and political pressure at the other, uh, at the, at the other side to do something uh, even though it may be counterproductive uh, certainly for those communities in the medium and long run and actually make them more vulnerable. So Kamal, I mean any reflections that you have on that, some, some thoughts that you would Well, I think the first point uh, to say is that uh, although uh, the assumption a lot of the times in post uh, disaster resettlement is that it will reduce risk uh, but even just for disaster risk I'm not talking about you know the wider basket of risks communities face one can question whether it actually achieves that there are three things that primarily in my assessment drive resettlement after a disaster the first thing is that the immediate, the fear that is caused by an event and hence an exaggerated um, perception of risk which does not take into account other risks and as you go uh, from week 1 to week 5 to month 3, month 5 that perception changes rapidly. But given the 
you know, political expediency of quickly making decisions about reconstruction and resettlement. A lot of decisions are made early on and in some ways you're stuck with it and it's very difficult to undo those uh, decisions. So, you know, uh, risk perception in a short window really drives decision making and even if you consulted communities, you know, you would perhaps, you know, come up with similar decisions. The other thing which drives it, you know, some pre-existing issues, you know, and a post-disaster situation provides a context, provides an opportunity to address those. Now, those pre-existing issues uh, are going to sort of do, take some corrective actions. Uh, those correct, if, if there are corrective actions on those pre-existing issues, one can question from who, whose perspective, corrective for whom. Uh, you take the example of uh, Maldives. Uh, before the tsunami, there was this program of consolidating population in some islands, uh, which had a very different dynamic. I would guess primarily to enhance efficiency in service delivery. And as soon as the tsunami happened, the, 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 essen the essence of what was being done was basically the same, but the narrative changed completely. So, you still need to consult the communities, but the, con the consultation is unidimensional about disaster risk. And if you push it quickly enough, you can achieve um, population consolidation in the name of safer islands. So, uh, and this is a pattern which we see in, in many different parts of the world. The third is, there is this uh, notion that, you know, there is somehow Efficiencies, uh, this happens particularly after earthquakes uh, in urban settlements. We've seen that in Iran, that discussion, it, resettlement didn't really happen, where, you know, there's a lot of debris, uh, services have been disrupted, and there is this perception, you know, why build where, you know, people have died, let's move somewhere else. And I think once you begin to actually do the maths, even from that perspective, it doesn't really really work. So these three things tend to drive and outcomes for people uh, in terms of uh, better life. Uh, one can question, sometimes it has been achieved, at other times it hasn't been achieved. So I would say that basically there are three kinds of things one could sort of look at to address this in, in, in a sort of, uh, in a manner where you're taking a, a long view of things. The first is that uh, although, you know, uh, risk assessments uh, or comprehensive risk assessments, hazard mapping for multiple hazards has become the flavor of the month and everybody is doing it, uh, I haven't seen many examples where it is available uh, in a digestible, uh, understandable format, not for the, uh, the state actors or planners, but for people. And the risk information communicated in a way where they can balance it off against other risks, such as risks to livelihood. So I think that, you know, putting that out in the domain and having methods by which we have risk information as early as possible after a disaster and making it available to uh, the, the people themselves and, you know, use that as a, as a, as a talking point for consultation or discussion in decision making. The second thing I would say is that we have numerous examples where uh, we facilitate uh, mutual learning between managers of reconstruction or resettlement. We take people from, you know, uh, say in, in recent uh, past, you know, people from Nepal to Boj uh, to Sikkim uh, and so on. But there are, there are hardly any examples where we facilitate peer learning among communities. You know, can we do that? Uh, I just wonder that, you know, okay, so let's, you know, there is a resettlement discussion in one particular situation. Let's take them, a smaller group or subset, to another situation where resettlement after disaster was done 20 years ago. And let's have a peer learning between, you know, communities rather than among, you know, uh, construction managers whose, whose stakes are of a very different kind. So I think that's the second thing um, one could explore. 
uh, and finally uh, there is uh, the the discussion uh, in a post disaster situation often is about uh, and when we talk about you know, consultation or participation uh, it is about uh, specific uh, specific physical reconstruction or to some extent you know recreation rejuvenation or uh, you know, better betterment of uh, uh, livelihoods. But what about having a conversation with affected people about the future they want, not just within the context of uh, reconstruction and resettlement, but what is the future state of, you know, their well-being? Where do they want to go? I know of only one example where it was framed like that, and, you know, we talked about it earlier this mo morning. Where in Balm, you know, the, the, the whole framing of reconstruction was the Balm we want. You know, where do we want to go? It is not about, it's not just about, you know, what should be the compensation package at the household level uh, in proportion with damage or in proportion with what you lost or whatever, but about, you know, looking a little bit ahead into the future and see where do you want to go and then work from there. So, uh, so I think that those two, three things maybe will help us get away from a sort of a, sort of a very quick knee-jerk reaction that, you know, we've had a bad disaster, this is a bad place to live, let's resettle somewhere else. Yeah, just to pick up on that thing, uh, two or three things struck me, uh, Kamal. The first thing is um, the question of um, of, of trying to sort of build and link communities and, and build that and link those community experiences. Uh, in the past it might have been actually quite difficult to take somebody let's say on the east coast of India and see what's happening the west, on the west coast. But today because of both social media and a lot more mobility it might actually be very interesting to do this. And uh, where I'm coming from is that over the last 25 years or so at least in India and other parts of the world. Um, social movements and struggles in various urban centers have actually taken the experience of evictions, of being on the footpath and being pushed out or you know whatever it is and built experiences and solidarity around, around that and you know maybe it's had limited impact but they are real examples of, 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 of that uh, impacting community action in, 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 in various ways. So I, I think it would be very interesting for us to try and see either with existing movements that do that and there are many of them in the, inside this country and other places uh, like STI and who does it in many other countries to use that as an opportunity to try and integrate disaster risk as another set of risks mm -hmm. uh, apart from the ones that they are used to. Eviction is a clear and present danger, uh, the loss of livelihood is a clear and present danger in everyday life, uh, violence because of the nature of the city is part of that. So how does one engage with them and build that? And then for people who are in, let's say, in a, in a territory, we were talking about Odisha earlier. If you're looking at, you know, one district and the other, at least within a state where things are relatively similar, similarly between hill areas, which are, we know are going to be uh, quite exposed uh, over the next, you know, 20 or 30 years uh, because of this great seismic gap in the Himalayas. If we're able to make those connections, uh, that I think would be really qu quite interesting. Uh, it may not cost too much money, but it, it requires a, a change in sort of mindset. But the biggest challenge for me, I think, is the... Uh, is the perception both from the point of view of the state and for communities and whatever civil society groups of the relationship between each other. Uh, it is the, uh, it is the, it is the uh, either hierarchical relationship or a relationship of distrust that actually populates that process and makes this kind of connection uh, somewhat difficult to enable. So you then go for the more instrumental thing saying I'll get my managers across, I will do X, Y and Z or I'll learn from whatever. Uh, and then UNDP or somebody else will come in and facilitate that because they're somewhat neutral. But changing the nature of uh, the relationship between uh, the state and the citizen, and we have interesting examples, you know, in Bangladesh, the entire thing over 25 years of setting up community-based disaster risk reduction, linking that to a you know, public system which then has credibility. Uh, I think from whatever I've learned of it, the, the reason why the risk evacuations were so effective was there was a political component to it where not only were the officers mobilized locally, but the MLAs uh, and the chief minister was actually present to make sure that's happening. So there's public trust in that process. So the process of building that kind of, uh, those kind of new, new connections. And I, you know, if you go back a long time in time and go back to what happened in Divisima, like just like really long time back uh, in, in, in Andhra, that yes, 77, 
that the shock that that created within within the society and the learning that happened in both in the public and the private sphere is, is something that is is difficult to manufacture. But if that gets internalized and institutionalized, uh, that might be an interesting place to to look at that. So I mean, you know, I, I imagine Karen is going to talk about a little bit of of the disjunct between public and private, especially on who controls what and the asymmetries of of wealth and income, uh, which yeah, which pick up on that well, space. We'll talk about that a bit later. I was you know, thinking of addressing directly uh, Alan's question here, which is about the role goal at limits of resettlement. Since I'm from Chennai, I thought I'd talk about the recent experience of the 2015 December floods. And um, where we found that the resettlement sites, the very large resettlement sites on the peripheries of Chennai, which have been uh, receiving uh, people who have been resettled from tsunami and other sort of uh, river restoration projects and infrastructure projects. I mean, they're the sort of de facto go to dumping grounds of uh, vulnerable people for the last, say, uh, some years. They were the worst affected. They were really sort of one floor deep in water, five, six feet of water, uh, which went away, came back again. So these places were in very bad shape. And because they were far out of the city, they were hard to reach with relief supplies. Uh, the state, which generally sort of neglects them, had pretty much abandoned them at this time. Uh, supplies were dropped by helicopter, um, and people were scrambling on the roads, fighting to grab them because there was, you know, the absence of the state here. So it was a very bad situation here, and some of us in the city were trying to figure out reaching them and figuring. And um, there were also then, of course, the informal settlements and slums on the river Adyar, which had flooded and breached and was uh, the main site of the inside the city disaster. Uh, so as the waters receded, about 10 days after, as waters were receding in both these spots, uh, there was the announcement that people from the slums um, on, on the river banks would be relocated to these resettlement sites. So that, I mean, I'm, I'm sketching this to give you an idea of what uh, we are dealing with here when we talk about risk-related resettlement. The kind of, uh, I think, range of agendas that get compressed into this discourse of risk, resettlement, protection of the people. We saw that after the tsunami as well. The whole, uh, you know, the, the state right after the emergency actions, the next action is where can we, you know, how can we remove people and where can we move them? And you know these are coastal lands that the state has been eyeing for a very long time for various other projects. So I'm kind of coming from there when I say, uh, so to, to take this now to the next step, typically, and I don't think only in Chennai, I think you see this in other cities, resettlement colonies are sited on ecologically fragile lands. They are sited on floodplains and other areas because once again, those are easily acquired. Uh, those are, you know, those are probably government common lands. I, they're, they're for a range of reasons, that's the place where they see fit to build these resettlement colonies. So again, that question, you're talking about the motivation of resettlement. So the big question mark on the motivation comes right there. What are you, you know, where are you resettling them? What is the uh, risk uh, associated with those sites? So it's not surprising that uh, if you look at studies of resettlement sites around the country, there are two or three common things that you see. One is, as we were talking about in the morning, crime and violence, which seem to come up in resettlement colonies as opposed to in you know, slums and cities. But secondly, flooding. All of these sites seem to have this very chronic problem of flooding, and that's because they are sited in those areas. So you know, that's the uh, second thing I wanted to point out. Um, so I think that, as you said, Alan, uh, movement and settlement Settlement and resettlement is part of the, I think, organic dynamic of uh, urban life, uh, probably rural life too. Uh, people do this and they make, make their calculations. They move for opportunity. They move for, for risk, um, et cetera. And we've seen this and I've seen, I've st uh, studied instances where the resettlement has brought, you know, your question was what, how is it an instrument of change? Brought profound changes for the, for the better um, in communities that have, for instance, renter communities or clusters of individuals in Chennai who have moved out of rented accommodation to the outskirts, to rural lands 
that they have settled and tamed all over again, you know, from being urbanists, they become sort of rural dwellers for a, a generation till they, you know, recreate the urban land again. And all of that has resulted in a profound transformation of their uh, lives and given them this mobility, um, etc. But so we also find almost, you know, uh, universally that forced resettlement of working class people to the urban peripheries, you know, has been a, uh, has actually reproduced vulnerability and poverty. I think this is so pretty well known. And so I think that uh, then the, 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 I guess the, the um, distinguishing factor there is the forced bit, uh, the mass bit, the, uh, you know, the, the, the peripheral bit, and what I referred to earlier today as a sort of a dumping framework. You know, you take people and you dump them there. And that dumping means that you actually have not, I mean, done any of the things that we were all talking about, which is get the site ready, make sure the amenities are there and better. I mean, these are people being moved from places where they have worked for years to put in good amenities. They have achieved those things. They moved to places where, which, you know, with promises of serviced sites. And those uh, sites, even in Tamil Nadu, which is supposed to, uh, you know, God knows, be governing a bit better than other places. But, um, you know, really poorly serviced places and basic things not thought out. Transport. You have buses, they're not enough. You know, you know, so just very simple things that can be done. Again, that question is the motive. So are you moving thing, people there to make their lives better or are you dumping them? So I think that, the, you know, uh, looking at it empirically in this way, we, I think, get a quite clear picture that <coughs> risk-related resettlement is a cover for other forms of governance uh, or other motives of governance that are being played out in this name. So I can talk about the other things later. Maybe. Sure, I, this is an interesting question because if, if you string it together, you could say that uh, both the state and other forces, specifically real estate in some cities, uh, will are using the opportunity of events and potential and real risk and in some cases the courts have also been involved in this process uh, to be able to continue the ongoing project of notionally sanitizing the city. So whether it is moving, uh, you know, polluting industries outside from the heart of cities or the outside which the courts have been quite active on from on the basis of trying to improve air quality x, y and z or moving people out of riverbeds. We had a discussion about this in, in Delhi uh, for a long time under you know, high court orders in some senses. Or just the act of making sure that you clean up some parts of the city which uh, need to be beautified and you know, made, made progressive and nice for a, a, a games process or because it offends somebody's sensibilities, a go go part of it. Uh, what I'm hearing is that there probably is a continuity uh, of opportunity that this actually provides us. The question then is, what are the what are the um, sort of <coughs> the measures that both communities and uh, and society at large can take to make sure that this kind of process is uh, you know a doesn't take place uh, or it's, it's sort of you know you, you actually protest against it and and, and and face it or is there structural measures where let's say your planning process itself integrates risk into the plan uh, so you know the areas that are going to be risky and they become, you know, do not reside zones apart from do not build zones. If you can't, you can't build in them, they're not, the non-development zones notionally, uh, then you shouldn't be able to reside in them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And coming back to Kamal's point of, of, you know, communities have a real challenge, forget about communities, I mean, even, even public institutions have a real challenge of understanding the nature of risk in a particular place in the city. So just making the city legible in terms of who lives there, what occupations actually are there, uh, you know, what kind of risk levels are there and making that publicly available. In other parts of the world, it is there because the insurance industry makes sure it is there because your mortgage is an X, Y and Z is, is available. That is not possible in this country. It has to be actually a public service that is provided where everybody knows what is actually happening there. So along with the fact that your Qatar records are available and, and whatever, you actually have data on whether the site is, you know, f can be flooded or not or is potentially in other locations on an on a unstable slope. And hence, you shouldn't be buying there. Or if you're doing it, <coughs> then you're doing full knowledge, uh, etc. So I'm just saying, the land records, for example, should be able to actually integrate some of this information in it. So when you're buying a thing, notionally, if the land land prices uh, actually are connected to this, 
it will start actually playing itself out. So I mean that, that's sort of one thing that strikes me, uh, you know, from 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 what you said. Transparency is actually quite quite important in this thing. But more than transparency, we actually don't have the information available, and that, that in a sense is something that, is, as as people who come from a scientific or technological or a planning background, it's imperative for us to act to try and make make the make the city legible in some senses. Uh, Anand, the story of categories, how does it play play out, or you know, any other quick reactions you may have to this conversation? I just wanted. To, uh, I'm going to kind of meander through a number of things sure. that you said. <coughs> First, a very quick response to what you just said about transparency in the city, not having enough information. Um, one of the things that we have realized in uh, Hyderabad and much of Telangana in the recent past is that uh, there are old revenue categories which very clearly tell you what the land can be used for and not used for. So, for example, Kondapuram Boku, Vagapuram Boku. These are all lands which are meant for flood control. They are not supposed to be turned into property. They are not supposed to be turned into productive use in any way. Wasteland development projects were the first ones to go for that. Uh, poverty elevation programs were the first ones to go for that. Gradually, there was a slide by which these ca old categories have gotten completely erased. And now you have a situation where there are a lot of people who are settled on them who are then bringing it back into the market. Right? So all of the water bodies in Hyderabad, the edges of them, the wetlands are occupied first by the poor and then they become part of the Gentrification. land that then becomes the lake view, shore view kind of apartment complexes. That's the struggle in many of our cities. So, But that basically then means that risk is something that we have known about, we have information about it, but there is a process that is very slowly creating conditions or it's producing a new map of the city in which these things are cannibalized, right? <coughs> okay. This is a complicated process. Just clip it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but taking off on that, I want to actually um, refer to a flag and issue, which is actually at this point of time building up into a massive disaster in this country the Kashmir situation. Right? <clears throat> Over the last one month, we have had a very large number of people who have been very badly injured. We don't know how that single hospital in Srinagar is able to deal with them. And the doctors are protesting. Some of the people that I have spoken with after the, the whole crisis began to build up in Kashmir, people who work in the informal trade, said something very intriguing. They said that, you know, before the flood, if the city is shut down for 60 days, we could still survive. After the flood, if the city is shut down for two days, we are starving. Right? Our resilience, our ability to deal with, with stress has gone down tremendously after the flood. Right? Now, <coughs> what are the kinds of ethical questions that this throws up? for particular kinds of professionals. And what, how, how does a doctor deal with the triage in a situation like this? Um, how does a planner deal with a situation like this? What kind of a mobilization is even possible when the whole uh, field is so completely um, fraught with risk for everyone even to open up? Right? So in a situation like that, our entire discussion about risk, resilience, Everything gets so mixed up. In, in, if we recognize then that whether it is coming from climate change or it is coming from the slow cannibalization of urban land, right? I mean, when we, when we uh, um, move people, when we allow first people of a certain kind to occupy lands that nobody else wants. Uh, and this is very clearly because not so much because it was the floodplain that people were not allowed, people didn't want to live there, but it's because the sewage is going through that. That's why the land value was not very high. Now we have the possibility of cleaning it up so that the value can become higher. So there are dirty, low value lands in the city with which dirty, low value human beings are associated who can now be separated and then it can be taken up and then you push them out to a distance from where it can be cannibalized a second time which is what the story that that uh, um, selva was telling us right about the number of 
times that each family has gone through resettlement. They are going through that resettlement process repeatedly through their lives so many times precisely because each time they are moved that piece of land becomes desirable for somebody else again and then they are moved out. So if that is the process and if we take that that seems to be the logic of the general process of resettling this land, it is in some sense actually the settling of the land. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a continuous ongoing process of settling the land in which revenue categories are erased, in which risk is constantly being deployed as a strategic tool for getting certain things done, um, for, for uh, making it possible for, for ensuring that we have certain benefits or each group is pushing for these things. How do we then make any kind of interventions in this? My own sense is that one of the things whether it is happening because of climate change or not, um, because of uh, a number of processes that have been going on in our cities over the last 20, 30, 40 years, I think we have been and we will be in the few coming future seeing a number of extreme local events. The kind of floods that we saw in Chennai, the kind of floods that we saw in Bombay, in Hyderabad in the 2001, in Srinagar, right, in Gauhati, everywhere. Uh, just last month we had this massive whirlwind in a very small area of Hyderabad which pulled down thousands of hundreds of trees. These kinds of local extreme events, cloud bursts, these are the kinds of things that are actually making risk become visible in new ways to us and there is an opportunity there. Because this is the moment that we can actually use now to try and figure out exactly which are the people, who are the places in the city that are facing the risks and then the question is how do we build the discourse, how do we build the, the arguments to shift the ways in which these things are done. I think one of the big challenges for a lot of the work that needs to be done in these situations is a complete institutional vacuum. You do not know who is actually responsible, who is going to be there for the next 10 years or 20 years to whom I can go and say that so what is what's the deal. The deal is offered by someone, often it is actually offered by consultants, it is not offered by the government. The deal is then implemented by somebody else and then I do not know who else to go and speak with. So to ensure that different parts of this are carved out in, an, in a meaningful way so that you actually start building institutions that are durable over a long period of time is one very important work making visible the emerging geographies which have always been there but it has become possible now because of the kinds of crisis that are hitting us on a day-to-day -day basis in very extreme forms and also because there are now technologies that are available and civil society more than ever before now has the capacities to actually build and throw up new technical knowledge which, which we just didn't have earlier. Right? Today it is possible for someone sitting in Bangalore to actually produce an earthquake map in Nepal and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very very important development which now gives us the opportunities to try and string together these five or six things that need to be done, Build, putting in place the institutions that can be held accountable, institutions that will be durable over a period of time, making the kinds of new risk geographies, vulnerability geographies that are becoming and figuring out the, the discursive form in which this needs to be done for the last Four years I have been sitting on maps of vulnerability in Hyderabad city. I don't want to share it with anyone because I know that that's the first thing that any real estate dealer would be looking for. We have maps like that for every city. We don't want to release those things to, to, to the general public because first thing that is going to happen is that it will be used to move people out of those places. And then risk is a very funny thing, right? So I can always build embankments to deal with the risk and I can build a gated community there in the same place from where I have removed a, a, a squatter community. So with that kind of a situation, we need to think about what languages do we use, what are the kind of things that can be tactically released at what point of time. And I think that to the extent that this is a question of dealing with, with the, uh, the longevity of development itself, we need to figure out strategies of organization that can stitch these different points which are very very unlikely connections that I have never seen not possible even to visualize in the past. So that's
So I mean, I, the, the point <coughs> you made about this actually being a hop, skip and jump process of settling the city in some senses, accepting that the people who are settling the city are the same people. Yeah, because they are acting to resettle and they are acting as pioneers by force in some senses. Yeah, We actually don't have either a good sociological, anthropological uh, or even a technical uh, expose of this. So I mean if you were able to do it for two or three cities, it will become much clearer to people what, what the real story is. Otherwise we get stuck with the, you know, a Dharavi story or an X and Y and Z. You don't see this is a, this is a, it's a larger pattern which then brings you in, into the domain of economic development, of planning and how you actually look at the expansion of the city. So, you know, being able to do that in two or three places may be something that's actually quite interesting. Also, the other thing that I found very interesting was, like you said, which is true, uh, because in, ag in agricultural landscapes, uh, at least the old settlement records did have the categories. Uh, so, as we move into urban landscapes, we're erasing those categories. Actually, we should be deepening them, because now we have the technology to do land capability analysis, look at ground and surface water slope, all that nonsense is easy to do with, because technically somebody sitting somewhere else can do it. <coughs> So I think one of the core, core opportunities would actually be as we start cleaning up and reorganizing our land revenue systems and our land record systems is to integrate this into that, into that record and make it mandatory yeah. that these categories should actually be available. Uh, in other ways, the market would do it, but now we will have to do it by statute or by law or by whatever it is, the disaster management agency should actually make it available at a, at a parcel scale. I mean, so that's, this, that's one, part, one part of the process. The other thing that, that I found very interesting um, in, in what you were saying is the question of institutions. And again, it's not only the question of the formal institutions. Actually, who's going to respond to you? It's the corporator or the MLA or the MP or what the corporator or MLA MP represents. It may not be the same person each time. You go back to them because they represent a certain continuity in the process because the other public institutions don't necessarily have a memory of this. So in some senses, when you have a vacuum of public memory, uh, in the public institutions, the question then is can you actually set it outside where it becomes much more collective mm -hmm. and both with uh, you know a whole range of web based technologies this kind of stuff can actually happen. You see that after an event yeah. where people are using WhatsApp and God knows what to actually respond. The question is can you institutionalize it so that that memory actually remains because people know that. I mean you go back to an oral history uh, and that's how you that's how you do the Laurette, Laurette kind of things. That, that's how we built up risk registers, you go back to newspapers, you go back to oral histories and, and try and do that. The question is can it in, in some places that become an institutionalized process that does not always have to uh, depend on the state actually providing that, that sort of uh, neutral ground uh, as far as that is concerned. I think that might be a, uh, a very interesting way forward. The other concern I had is maybe because of the examples we took, the discussion may have a slightly metropolitan bias because you know. The land market is very active in a few places, but a lot of small places don't actually have a very active land market. I mean, at least developers don't go there because they don't make too much of money. The question I have is in, in smaller places, you know, one lakh towns, places are a little, little bigger, what the real estate guys call tier, uh, tier 3, is there an opportunity for us to actually pick up smaller places and work with them to integrate these processes inside mm -hmm. before these dynamics take over and completely swamp, swamp that thing because, you know, there are at least a few thousand places like that yeah. and that will actually change the risk landscape as it works its way out, as it will sort of change the development landscape. The challenge there of course is institutional capacity in civil society, in local government, uh, in the citizens themselves. So one, 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 <coughs> one last thing I would like to add to that is that I think one of the, the things that has happened with this erasure of older categories and knowledge systems is uh, a complete inability in our institutions to deal with the fine print of the law, right? We just cannot seem to be able to come up with the necessary instruments of leasing land, of giving out work on contract, none of that. It's all one big blank space in which <coughs> the, the details, the, the nitty gritty of, of, of getting things done and making people work by those rules is completely disappeared. And I think that's the biggest disaster that we have actually seen. And, and the risk that we are facing because of that is huge. Yeah. Sorry, Karen. Just, uh, you know, I know that the whole issue of uh, land grab became uh, centered in, you know, say in my uh, thing. But I think in a larger way, I again want to point out that I think when you talk about risk and resettlement, I'm going to sort of re-emphasize this point. I think the waters are very muddied in Indian urban contexts uh, by three or four factors. One of them is the huge uh, sort of shortage of affordable housing. 
So, uh, you know, whether it's uh, big cities or smaller cities, the shortage of uh, decent formal housing or land that people have uh, access to and can buy um, is, is, has mounted, has become a, a really ma major problem. So that offering um, resettlement becomes a sort of a, you know, it, it has a different color. It becomes a sort of what we've been referring to as property baiting sure. of people. Tenure security as a yeah, tenure security yeah. as a way. So it becomes easy to uh, lure people away from areas that you want to. So it changes, I think, the equation there quite a bit. So I think that's one muddying factor. Uh, the other one is um, very poor spatial planning and regulation of settlement, which makes the whole issue of encroachment a huge part of the discourse. So uh, there, I think, we, when we're talking about discourse and terms and categories, we need to look at this idea of encroachment once again. It really came up. It was the key word of uh, post-December in, uh, in, in Chennai, mm. encroachment. I mean, it's been, uh, it come every uh, um, pre-monsoon, you start having encroachment talk coming up in the city. And then uh, the encroachment talk was loud uh, after January. And what you notice, the pattern of that discourse, is that encroachments are defined primarily in legalistic terms. People whose uh, claim to the land is not formal or uh, you know, not licensed, not approved. But, uh, we, uh, and, and I think uh, that is obviously referring to uh, the informal settlements on the rivers, etc. where the, um, I think, and this is an argument that a journalist I know has been making, is that um, the risk that they pose is primarily to themselves. They are the vulnerable people. These are small, whatever, houses thatched or, or whatever, where um, they're not big enough encroachments to really block drainages to the point where you can have a huge flood. And then there are the locationally defined encroachments, which we don't talk about. That is not really what, so these are the, you know, the airport extension built on the Adyar River. Mm. Um, you know, the uh, mass rapid transit uh, train line built along the Buckingham Canal. The, um, you know, elevated highway that they're building into the bed of the Coam River. And, and these are encroachments that People have protested against, environmentalists have fought against, and yet get built. Um, and, and then those are not actually termed encroachment. So I think the, the, the discourse around terms like this, uh, one need to be uh, looked at. So, when I, so again, talking about spatial regulation, planning, allowing, uh, where, where do you allow? I mean, also at the, uh, people have been talking, uh, some of the chief planners from our uh, China Metropolitan Development Authority right after this were talking about the fact that they, they, you know, there really needs to be a push for integrating contour maps into building permission applications, etc. cetera. And, uh, but at the same time, if you, you know, we very quickly saw in the papers that building permissions are being liberalized, deregulated, single window, et cetera, et cetera. In the meanwhile, of course, real estate has slumped in all of these areas. So um, it's unclear how this spatial regulation is going to have more teeth, although mm. there are ideas. Um, Alan, Alan, yeah, this has been a fairly India-centric con conversation. So maybe you should come in, come in to provide a little bit of no, I, I just want to take on one point, um, which then relates into um, Kamal's point about risk analysis. And I'll precede that by saying we did a study um, for CDKN like four years ago in Latin America with eight countries, a study of 60 risk analyses related to decision-making processes. Um, and the study was, was taken up on because governments apparently in the region asked why there was so much risk analysis and so little decision based on it, but most of it was archived away, okay. And we found seven reasons why this happened. One of them, which I find really interesting we've, we've come to, was that for a lot of decision makers, disaster risk analysis only points out to negativity, whereas risk is opportunity. Yeah. And that relates to why people settle in risk-prone areas, the opportunities many times as opposed to the disadvantage. But that's just a sideline on the, on the thing. But it's interesting here that we know that the vast majority of what we call resettlement or relocation is post-impact. In fact, the three cases you mentioned are post-impact. We don't find 
very many cases of preventive resettlement or relocation. We have to wait for the big event for then people to be moved out of future harm's way, but they then suffered harm which could have been anticipated previously according to risk analysis. But what is interesting here is that then risk analysis becomes a completely different thing in post-impact mm. as opposed to pre-impact. Because resettlement post-impact is different financial mechanisms, different, um, uh, different um, institutions, um, and a different whole load of other things to preventive. You know, prevent is more likely to be re linked to a wider development perspective, like land use planning, um, rescuing um, areas that have been destroyed because of, um, of wetlands, etc., um, and a series of other things. Whereas post impact is eminently related to reconstruction, it's inevitably related to um, um, uh, processes whereby people are are given temporary housing which then turns into permanent housing a lot of the time etc so they're completely different ball games they're not even uh, from my perspective they shouldn't even be in the same um, discussion they're apples and pears the other two things and then if you think of other types of reset they're different so but the question is what is risk analysis in a preemptive case as opposed to risk analysis in a post-impact case and, um, you know, because of all the perceptions, uh, the risk has been, we're not even talking about risk analysis. In the post-impact stage, we're talking about disaster-related resettlement. In the prior case, we're talking about risk-related resettlement. Mm. Because one is anticipating a future that has not occurred. The other is responding to the damage which has occurred. So they're completely different things. And it's obvious why it's mainly post-impact. But what we've got to move to is a, a wider vision of pre-impact relocation. But then I go back to the point that that's almost impossible because it's just too many people, too many communities on slopes, on riverbeds, etc. So what are the alternatives which we can't forget about? And this is, brings us back to the essence of a discussion on disaster risk management. We have to move out of reactive response and preparedness into a more substantiated development-based preventive activity. No? How to do that? That's a big challenge. It doesn't seem as if we've gone very far, despite the conceptual advances and the discourse, that transition into development-based preemptive prospective disaster risk management is still in pañales, in, in um, napis, in, in most parts. No? Just before I ask Kamal to respond, you know, there's, there's one way of trying to maybe get, get, get through this conundrum and this comes from a piece of work that some of us were, a seminal piece of work that some of us were involved about 10-12 years ago in Gujarat. When you look at composite risk and this didn't look at quotidian, it didn't look at everyday risk. When you look at composite risk, the interesting thing is that it's Pareto partitioned. That is 80% of the risk you can find in 20% of the areas. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually find those areas, whether it is over the entire state landscape, which is what we did, or inside cities, then you can actually, you know, you, you can mitigate a whole range. That, that, that's a part of, of the process. The risk concentration is very heavy. So, and similarly, vulnerability also is concentrated in similar kinds of ways. So it's not as if these landscapes are unknown. Historically, they've been known. But it's, it's not so difficult for us to actually do that. Uh, and if you're able to institutionalize that in the process, then maybe there's an easy way of doing it without boiling the entire ocean and, you know, setting up very complex systems. But, you know, Kamal has been doing this for years, so he's got a lot of experience I in this. I'll just focus on the, uh, the method aspect of uh, what uh, Alan was talking about. Uh, how do you do resettlement uh, to, to work in a preventative way and be informed by risk considerations? So, what we've seen in the last 20 years in terms of uh, risk assessments. Uh, they are fantastic tools and we have made huge progress. But, uh, and you know, the average annual loss, uh, you know, where they, it is located, etc. But it is too, in my uh, view, it's too static mm -hmm. and it is too focused on the object you are assessing the risk for. You're not looking at what risk it is in turn uh, creating. We are also not talking about the, you know, interacting, intersecting geogra geographies of risk. So you may build uh, an elevated highway 
and you do a, an assessment for it and you ensure that it is not affected by flood, cyclone, earthquake. But what happens to people living under it? Uh, what happens to people who take the highway and go and settle in uh, marshlands and in, in turn make that marshland, you know, uh, habitable and then, you know, it becomes, uh, then, you know, it gets gentrified and so on. So I think on that, I think the quantitative tools that we have are very sort of limited to have that sort of discussion. It's almost like scenario planning, scenario, <coughs> scenario projection. Uh, discussion. Uh, there has been very little sort of public policy dialogue around risk assessment which goes beyond the locational quantitative risk assessment to looking at these these wider contexts. Yeah, I mean, so for example, if I just take the city, there are some key strategic risks that the city is expo exposed to including a severe risk of drought and local flooding. I mean, the, the thing about Bangalore is the, you know, the other risks are actually very, very low both from high winds or from seismic tectonic stuff that's there. But you do have to and let's say the regional planning processes here, the master planning processes have to work down those multiple levels. You've got to look at strategic risk because you can do fantastically well on the economic front, you can have relatively poor poverty, but eventually the city runs out of water or if you know a large parts of it keep getting flooded and then people start sort of moving out whether the investors or otherwise, it doesn't help. So you do have to have those gradations and I, I think our planning frame really struggles with this because the instruments are not in place, the institutional capacities are not in place and the examples of where this actually works and delivers positive political outcomes. Mm. Because in some senses if the political outcomes don't come, it's, 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 it's a stupid thing for a, you know, for a politician to invest in something which is going to help somebody two tenures down, uh, etc. Because it, th that's not how the political cycle sort of uh, actually works in some senses. So th that, th that point is, is, is really well taken. that. We want to look at both the, the short, medium and long term. We also want to look at the local, uh, you know, the city wide stuff and the regional and working across <coughs> these three sets of scales is not something that we know how to do very well. And because, it, you know, we're a relatively new country to organization, we actually don't have the mechanics or the institutional capacity to do it. We're always sort of mucking around between here and there. And obviously in the interstitial things, two things happen. One is that the real estate and other interests can grab whatever they can. But also the inverse also happens that poor people do have in those interstitial spaces the opportunities to survive, which is his question about opportunity. It is the, the fact that some riverbeds are unused or some uh, Perambok lands are not uh, marked or X, Y and Z that is, that is used as opportunities. But the, I guess the, the larger question is the social and the economic cost uh, for, you know, anyway. So but I, oh. I mean just from what you were saying about preemptive uh, resettlement. Um, I mean, I think we've, I've been hearing repeatedly that in the disaster risk management community, which I'm not part of, um, resettlement is seen as the last resort, as it should be. Um, <coughs> and I, when I'm listening to all of what you are saying, it sounds to me that we really have no idea what's coming down the line. And we have very little, few ways of actually uh, figuring it out. You know, whether, uh, particularly in multi-hazard settings that are many parts of uh, coastal cities, at least in India. So, we have absolutely no idea. And so, to preemptively relocate people, which should really be the last resort, sounds to me that that should be the sort of last, last thing. Because, in a, in a sense, uh, as we also were discussing in the last couple of days, people have developed all kinds of routines, right, of coping with all kinds of things that come down the line in bigger to smaller um, uh, sort of registers that, that they hit with. Um, to, if you look at it today, after the floods, almost everybody has settled back in. They've gone back to normal. The ones who haven't, who are, who are sort of still traumatized and have just begun, are the ones who have been resettled. But everybody else, well, even the you know, slum dwellers on the banks of the river who had to move out for 20 days, three weeks, whatever, are all back in their normal lives. So I'm saying, you know, we, this, we kind of, because we, we are still, as I understand it, quite clueless, um, it seems to me that preemptive resettlement doesn't sound like something we are equipped in any way to do. Um, and if we are, if we decide that we have to do it and you know, whatever you say, the 20% or whatever, I think the standards of proof, the standards that uh, you know, 
uh, the administration has to be held to to say what else can or could have been done uh, <coughs> before you move people and expose them to all of these other new risks. Uh, those standards have to be quite high. And um, the sort of imperative of that conversation, that uh, discussion, and as, as I started off saying, I think the waters are so muddied by the kinds of agendas people have pursued in the name of risk and resettlement, that the rebuilding of trust and the rebuilding of the capacity to dialogue between particularly you know, vulnerable citizens and the state has to be built up in a very slow way. So uh, to me, like I'm an anthropologist, so I'm coming from that uh, angle of what, you know, uh, how, what are the relationships that need to start slowly getting into place in order to, to talk about, you know, to have any kind of credibility to this idea of preemptive resettlement. Can we just answer that? Sure, please. <laughs> I don't believe that's true. <laughs> so I think, you know, I've heard in almost every post-impact <coughs> case that there was a risk analysis, there was a study, there was an antecedent of the event that occurred, which would give sufficient evidence that something could, with a certain level of security, happen at some time undefined in the future. You know? and, and what this would mean then, if that was true, is there's no decision-making process in resettlement. No, the decision is taken by disaster. <laughs> so, so, so we shouldn't even be discussing decision-making <coughs> only where to put them. But decision-making where to put them under disaster conditions could be and probably is a completely different process to... So I, I, I just, to arm the polemic, I don't... You know, in the end, if we accept that premise, then risk analysis as a preemptive prospective procedure. It's not, I, I'm working with GIZ on introducing um, uh, risk analysis into public investment decisions in Latin American countries. Um, and if that premise was correct, then there's no point in doing it now. <laughs> so so I, I think it's um, a little doubtful, the statement, but it's open to discussion. <laughs> Just Sorry, a there, there's a little bit of a contest here. One thing is that, you know, Alan mentioned that fairly early in, in this discussion, and that is with climate, the, the entire landscape changes dramatically. So, you know, two years ago when I was leading the IPCC assessment on, on, on this on, on the urban side, I remember all of us sitting in a room and, you know, the, maybe the top set of people in the world doing this stuff, and we were paralyzed because we had just done an assessment of seven different cities. And frankly, if we get into a post two degree world, then it doesn't matter what the city is. And it was London, New York, and you know, at one end, and also small cities in Africa and India that we were doing the assessment for. But it doesn't matter, it makes a difference of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. The Thames barrier cannot protect London, even though it's one of the most expensive infrastructures, if you go into a post-degree kind, two, two degree kind of situation. So, and, it, and I'm not talking about sea level rise at the moment, I'm just talking about, you know, Definitely. flooding, um, whatever, coastal erosion, and a whole range of other hydromet efforts. Sea rise, sea rise is a completely different story. Um, so the question then is, and you know, uh, how do you actually cope with these extreme ecologies? How do you uh, cope with these extreme situations uh, at a at a significantly <coughs> large scale? And it seems inevitable that we have to start talking about this this relatively quickly, because cities uh, we're building infrastructures like the metro is designed for 60 or 80 or 100 years. Uh, people are living in 70 or 80 years. So inevitably, if this is going to be reality, then most people, whether they're poor or they're rich or they're middle class, are going to experience some form of, of dislocation uh, sometime in, in, in their lives. So because uh, both lives are longer, cities typically have much longer life cycles, the infrastructure that we're building and the concentration of populations that we're going to increase with are going to be much longer, uh, we have to take this into account. And inevitably, in some locations, uh, you have to think of unthinkable things. I mean, I've done this in the Northern Netherlands where we said, look, guys, you have to bring down the dikes because eventually uh, a combination of North Sea storms and sea level rise will make it impossible for you to actually push the Rhine over that over those dikes. You can keep on raising the dikes that we've been doing for 300 years, but if you do another three or four meters, you'll have to set up three, four nuclear power plants to push the Rhine over the water, I mean, over, over, over the dike. So I think that, that that's, I, I don't want to sort of, you know, paralyze people with that thought, but we have to start thinking about these questions because young people who are born today or yesterday or whatever it is, will inevitably face these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's sort of one, one, one part of the process. The, the, uh, the other question, of course, 
um, is, uh, I guess, partially what, what, what I, I, I'm Alan was talking about. And that is, how does one respond, respond to this in, in the short and medium term frame so that it actually becomes propositive and you can make all of these things come, come together. And we don't actually have a discourse to enable that. And we certainly don't have some really good examples where it actually works. I mean, I, I remember the classic example of Bombay. The man who authored the disaster management plan in 2005 was in charge of the management of the city when that, when that event happened. Okay, so we, we knew exactly where the bottlenecks were, we know what was happening. It was, all, it was all on paper, it was done three years before that. But in spite of that, uh, when the event happened, you know, everybody had to muck around on their own. And in, in some senses, uh, the structural factors overturned everything else that actually would happen. And that, that's, that's, that's the operational challenge that we have. Embedded in the institutional system is, is an ability not to be able to, to preemptively act, or if you do preemptively act, it's in, 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 in to enable certain interests. And the post facto action also enables the same process uh, to play itself out. Uh, and there's sort of no way of interrogating it, excepting in this extreme condition of, you know, everybody's in a bad shape, let's do something about it. Or, you know, let's sort of cleanse the city and, uh, and relocate, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it has to become a much more diverse discourse. Any other quick questions before we open it up for, for, for a dialogue? Any other quick responses? Or I, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is that maybe one thing that, um, although it is not uh, in the context of climate change, uh, the kind of preemptive resettlements that we have done all have to do with big dams. When you build a dam, you move people out because there's a risk of their getting flooded. Sure. And I think that it's, it, it'll be useful to um, look at the processes and the institutions that got involved in, 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 in doing this relocation. Um, when we think about what is actually going to happen. And I think that it can actually have a lot of lessons. I don't think that we have done that, um, enough work on those kinds of processes uh, until now. Um, but, but the, the, um, the one thing I wanted to do is to try and see if we can connect what uh, um, Aro has said and what Kamal has said, which is that we do not have the necessary tools as of now for dynamically modeling the relational spaces of risk. And I think that's absolutely true. Uh, but relationality is something that people are constantly experiencing, right? And they're constantly throwing up experience in all sorts of forms. We don't quite know how to model it. We don't quite know how to, um, how to um, quantify it, you know, all sorts of problems with that. Scenarios is one way of doing it, but it already erases a whole bunch of things. So we don't quite know what the techniques would be. But related to that is the question of why is it that the, the politician doesn't find it useful to act on that within that time frame of five years for which he is going to stay in office. It's precisely because within that five years he doesn't actually apprehend that anything is going to happen that would require his intervention or that he's going to benefit from that, right? And I think that that the work that therefore needs to be done by people who are not stuck in the logic of actually implementing these projects, which has to be from research institutions outside of governments, outside of corporate houses, outside of even activist groups, because all of them work with particular kinds of time horizons that don't allow them to do things, right? There is where we need to try and figure out how to produce these ways of modeling that's where we need to figure out how to produce the stories and that's where we need to actually build the organization that is going to make it necessary for the politician to respond to. And I think that's the political challenge that we haven't quite figured out how to do in our cities. And maybe one way to do this is to think about that scale at which it can happen, which is that the cities in India do not have the necessary agency. It happens at the chief minister's office, which is the entire state. So you don't really have a municipal corporation which is capable of responding to it, which is the only one which is schematically <coughs> capable of responding. And that's the thing that we need to really f push against. Alan, last before we stop. Yeah, just a very last but on preemptive, which I know is very difficult. <laughs> and it's almost impossible to identify something that is completely preemptive in the sense that most of these places, to call them up, that have moved have suffered 
some type of loss and damage previously. But normally it's in that scale of those small and medium events, recurrent, which are then thought that it could get to something else. But what I'm fascinated by in Latin America, for instance, is, and I, I make a hypothesis, your, your attitude to preemptive resettlement or even to risk mitigation, risk prevention, risk reduction, is very much colored by the development over time of this whole topic within your national boundaries. Mm. In Latin America, we used to the example of Colombia. Colombia has large-scale preemptive resettlements of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people in a new zone affected by climate change now. Whole cities which have been relocated because of risk. There's no other country in Latin America that it comes to that scale. So what is happening here is, you know, and, and Colombia has been challenged as being a leader in disaster risk management, but it was certainly with its reformation of the law in 1989 and the introduction of more criteria on prevention mitigation, it is certainly the country that has gone through the biggest debate and has the most people we know in Latin America associated with renovating the topic. And so one has the attitude that certain things become possible once you have worked through the other things and once you see the costs of reconstruction on such a massive scale time after time after time and so I, it would be interesting comparative studies of how the whole development of these systems and the way people have mindsets on them in fact influence the future development of these systems and, and Colombia is astounding that sense there are a large number of preemptive movements thing you won't find in many other countries in Latin America where they're still very much stuck in a preparedness and response mode, not even going through the other stages of, 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 of disaster risk reduction like retrofitting hospitals or constructing dikes or reforesting um, forest basins so the rivers don't flow so fast, etc., etc. No? But anyway, I'll finish. Good, yeah. thanks. So have we open up the discussion here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In in our country, actually. Who will take, give a call, who will take the call of pre empty uh, uh, risk management actually? If thing doesn't happen, we never approach. That's what, uh, what is our experience in that Kendra Pada Satavaya actually, when number of villages actually taken away by the yeah. sea yeah. erosion and all those things, thing has come to our mind and we take it. But had it been so, the pre emptive settlement, we could have done it. A lot of things are uh, saved in there. But in that, uh, Kamal Kisar actually has to think and uh, put that mind in the uh, MH actually. But that is very important. I can tell you, who will take a call? If we don't do anything, we don't do anything actually. If we don't do but in Colombia and Latin, uh, Latin American countries actually, their ecological problems, they immediately yeah. preempt the settlement and do it. But regarding uh, Anand thing, actually, about the pre-settlement of our uh, big dam people and other things. But that can be handled with combination of two things, actually. Uh, our rehabilitation resettlement policy of the government, actually, we got the uh, initial knowledge. Uh, sometime, I, I remember, 2006 and 7, uh, uh, from Karnataka, <coughs> that has been replicated in our state, actually. Uh, but that plus our present thing, that digital management, uh, reconstruction, Combine that, we can address it. Good. So, open, open house. Yeah, we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll uh, get the panel to respond. The panel to respond. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Preeksha Kumar. I work for a human rights organization that specifically uh, called the International Accountability Project that specifically looks at ending forced evictions caused by development projects. And this is something that we see very often is that, you know, you have development projects that are meant to benefit a certain population and in and of themselves they are harmful and reproduce the very inequalities and vulnerabilities that the people they're supposed to help actually are supposed to avoid. So um, one thing that I wanted to raise and um, wanted to know your thoughts on is that with all planning, development planning, and specifically maybe even disaster risk management planning. The plans are thought of, designed, finalized, discussed, um, shared, like publicly notified, almost in isolation and separate from the 
people who are directly affected by these plans. People are going to be resettled, people who have the most interest in what's going to happen. Um, and specifically in India, where you have all of these complex agendas and uh, different interests, um, opening that space for the state or institutions to actually prioritize community leadership and involvement in these plans is not something that's um, welcomed or is something that's you know, actively opposed to. So where's the space to even build that public trust when you know, these plans are created in isolation by technical experts, by institutions, by um, bureaucracies that are not, um, that very fundamentally are hostile to local expertise, knowledge, and experience. Can we take another yeah. couple of questions? Yeah, great, thanks. I think Rohit is next. Sorry, we'll yeah. take a few more. So uh, my question is actually it was all already pointed out uh, that short term considerations are very different than the long term considerations and decisions dis decisions are taken in a short term perspective I think you mentioned Kamal. So my question and it is for any of these panel members is that how do we balance that? How do we really look into the short term needs but also at the same time bring in a certain vision which is uh, kind of taking into account these longer term uh, impacts? Anybody else? Any more questions? For the moment, we can take another round later. And you can think through. Yeah. yeah? Okay. So, open. Who would like to respond to? Either, just, yeah. Come on. It'll be on. Just, yeah. uh, I can't uh, necessarily comment on development planning as a whole, but disaster risk management planning uh, specifically. I think your observation that, you know, they are. Uh, done in isolation with uh, little, if at all, uh, consultation, if any, uh, consultation with the people is, uh, is correct. Uh, but at the same time, that's beginning to change. Uh, and as far as disaster risk management planning is concerned, I mean, aside from the sort of, uh, you know, decades or more than a century old uh, planning for drought relief, uh, disaster risk management planning is relatively new in the country. Uh, I think all the states have now a plan. Uh, we have a national plan. And it's now percolating down to uh, the district level as well. And there as well, there is a sort of evolutionary process. Uh, because our act is called the Disaster Management Act, our plans are also called disaster management plans. But in essence, they don't have to be just disaster management plan. They have to be disaster risk management plans. But for now, we are stuck with that uh, terminology. But the first generation of uh, the plans at the district level were quite focused on, um, even though the, the sort of guidance is to have them, you know, comprehensive risk management plan, were quite focused on just looking at uh, relief and response, you know, because that's what uh, is uh, sort of, you know, front and center. Uh, and, you know, th that we have to be able to respond effectively uh, no matter what, you know. Or at least that's, that's how it should be sort of evaluated. But that's beginning to change. And when the next generation of plans are coming, when some states were revising their plans, you see a much different process of planning. I mean, there are two states that come to my mind immediately where the district level planning is actually happening from village level up you know assam and bihar are examples so hopefully that will change because there is a realization that you know it's like standalone uh, you know expertise oriented uh, plans have their limits they may achieve something but they they will not go all the way so that's changing gradually uh, and i think in the next 10 years the hope is that this whole framework that the Act provided in 2005, the next push has to be really at the local level. You know, in terms of national level structures, there is more clarity than we had uh, 10 years ago, but we really need to do a lot more work at the local level. And their participation, consultation is ine inevitable. Village level disaster risk management plans have happened in a number of states. But in a number of states, they have also been very sort of, you know, response oriented and very, uh, you know, facilitated by consultants, uh, not really enough.
consultation. But that's beginning to change. We are a long way from it. Just a quick uh, um, example that I can um, sort of think of. Uh, the coast, I, I don't know about disaster risk management plans, but uh, the coastal zone management plan for the district for Chennai district um, was being a, a consult a sort of mandatory consultation was to be held uh, in Chennai this was a few years ago and uh, it was as I mean I think you've been trying to point out uh, the effort was to hold it quickly with not much you know people <coughs> coming in there to debate and discuss it was also a very poorly prepared plan the um, you know the land the land use mapping the coastal land use mapping was um, wrong and and of course it was put out only in English etc. So fishers in uh, uh, in Chennai who have been organizing themselves lately a, a lot around using um, mapping GIS and and sort of uh, other information of this kind to understand their own lands better uh, quickly got wind of it you know, attended the meeting, first of all demanded that the meeting should be postponed until this thing was circulated in Tamil. It was discussed in all the Fisher Panchayats. They came their length, they disputed the land use map, you know, the land use categories that were in there. Uh, they had their own maps which showed it. So the, the plan was withdrawn and it's, you know, being modified to uh, take in all of these. So I think that there seems to be, uh, you know, also an imperative that Communities take the opportunities by their own capacity enhancement, they force capacity enhancement in these agencies, which otherwise get away with shoddy stuff. So I think that's uh, also part of what we're finding. I want to quickly say a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> just responding to this question of uh, um, government agencies involved in... No, here's uh, why it is fine. Government agencies involved in either disaster uh, related situations or otherwise not sharing uh, information transparently with the communities, what, what is being planned out and so on and so forth. I think um, there's several, th several reasons why this doesn't happen, right? One of the reasons is that um, when we say that risk or a disaster or some kind of an intervention is an opportunity, it's basically a window of opportunity in which an inexhaustible list of claims is going to surface and nobody knows exactly how to organize all those claims in any meaningful way. Unless you have a responsible social movement which is there, which is able to organize all of those claims, the, the government authority here does not have a, um, an interlocutor that he or she trusts and in the absence of that trust, Essentially what they say is that, so some politician would walk in, exaggerate all of these claims and then we are stuck, therefore we are not going to release the information. And we saw this in a very, very, very poignant way in the tsunami public hearings. Um, in one place, the district collector was one of the persons who was testifying and all the fishermen were standing there and the district collector told us in English that, you know, the people here have been claiming that they have two boats, three boats, when they actually had only one boat. And we said, can you say that in, in, in Tamil? And he was scared. Then we got it translated and one fisherman stood up and made a very passionate speech saying that, look, I'm a fisherman. I go out into the sea. I'm a single human being fighting against the nature to make a living. Why would I lie? Why is he treating me like a beggar, like a cheat? Right? It's a very weird situation that, that nobody knows how to handle that drama. And I think the, the problem actually is as much a problem of governance as it is a problem of not having credible social mobilization. The second reason is that a lot of the government records over time for a variety of micro level political reasons I mean, are not, are not, are, are not uh, uh, what they should be. They don't reflect the actual situation on the ground. We saw this in Singur. In Singur, much of the land in the actual government records was recorded as single crop and there was a reason for that. It had to do with the kind of relationship that the farmers in the village had with the local revenue officials. They wanted it recorded as single crop when it was actually multi-crop. Now when it comes to the compensation, 
on the ground you can see it is multi crop in the government records it is single crop and then we can say that the government is lying the government at that point can turn around and say that but look i i lied because they wanted me to lie for all these years because they wanted to show it as single crop but they can't quite say it because if how can you admit that the government has been producing bogus records for local political reasons so that's the problem but there was another question here yeah yeah, may, <coughs> yeah go ahead Maybe, maybe I can take up on, on your point and the last point this morning um, and phrase it in terms of you know, analytical schemes, mindsets towards understanding and where, from my perspective, in a lot of work on this, we limit ourselves to an analysis of product and we forget about process and therefore we get rid of the short, medium and long term in terms of the analysis in this case of resettlement, and in the case of disaster as well. And, and this derives from a thing, after Hurricane Mitch, which affected Central America in 1998, you know, in the presidents of Central America, and particularly the president of Honduras, said that the country had been thrown back 35 years in its development. Well, to that we replied in written things, well, what development was thrown back when most of what was destroyed was of the poor, which was a product of underdevelopment, not of development. But that was one argument which we, we put out. Um, but the other one was um, the idea that disaster losses were 10 billion. Okay, so you have an event that affects a series of countries, a large-scale event, 20,000 deaths in Mitch, and losses are $10 billion direct and indirect. And so when you look at a social construction view of risk, and you say risk is built up because of social processes, social product, um, skewed development, etc., and what happens when the event occurs is only capturing what has occurred 50, 60, 100 years previously in building up the risk. So really, why don't economists, when they analyze disasters, discount all of the benefits and gains, obviously by others, through the 50 years before Mitch, through deforestation, forcing population off the land into the cities, into slum conditions, etc. So why don't we discount all of those earnings from the losses when it occurs? No, because we're short-sighted, we just go to the short term. So with resettlement, if we look at the people that are being resettled, normally we take as the point of analysis where they are at the moment they're resettled. And then we take as the point of comparison where they are once the resettlement process is finished in formal terms. And we come to the conclusion that it is bad in general, right? Doesn't, it doesn't take account of the other risk factors. But if you look at the resettled population, when they settled 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, they invaded land and they were very happy, and I don't want to be, you know, to get a piece of land. But they didn't have any services, they didn't have any housing, etc. And over time, they built up these things. They created conditions of risk, or conditions of risk were reaffirmed. But they got to a point where they had livelihoods, and they had belonging to land, and they had culture, they had heritage, they had a relationship. And then we resettled them, and these things aren't seen to be recreated at the time. So this, to me, what it says is that when we look at resettlement, there's a question about what is the minimal things. You know, we have, for a lot of disaster stuff, this thing that the Red Cross and all of the NGOs, etc., put together, minimal requirements or minimal standards for housing during reconstruction, etc. For resettlement, maybe we need that in two phases. One is what is absolutely minimal requirements with a resettlement scheme, that is, there is adequate housing, adequate services, there is ownership of land, and there is relative access to work. And then the second thing is, what do we put in place which allows them as a community to build up a process over time such that in 10 years, when we analyze, yeah. we find they're in a great position and not in the position we thought they were in. And there's a problem of analytical scales. You know, that normally, and we point this out in our reports, that when people analyze reconstru um, resettlement schemes, they analyze it from the perspective of the analyst. 
yeah. not from a perspective of who put the scheme together. <laughs> you know, the only legitimate analysis is what you pretended to do against what was done. That doesn't, of course, mean you can't think in a wider utopian world of what should have been done, but there's no point in analysing something against something that was never proposed. What you do there is to propose that that should be incorporated as considerations in any resettlement scheme and become normative, obligatory and human rights based, etc. Some more questions? Anybody else has any quick responses, comments? People at the back? Yeah. In Odisha context, when we uh, planned for ODRP, we saw, uh, I am not uh, distinguishing between uh, the um, urban characteristics for uh, this uh, resettlement options uh, or the rural characteristics. But when we thought about this ODRP uh, project in Odisha, we thought that uh, the entire uh, housing uh, will be done by in situ process. But the house sizes were not up to mark and we shifted to relocation uh, or dislocation, whatever it is. Uh, we could not find many places, at least four or five places where government land, uh, appropriate government land is available. Therefore, we, uh, we were in a process of deleting 400 to 500 beneficiary from the list that no government land in uh, your area is available, we are undone, please forgive us, we cannot include in you as a, uh, a beneficiary list. They did not accept this, they, uh, they were organized, they themselves purchased 50 acres of land, private land, to get this. Uh, opportunity of having 3 lakh rupees house and we are building 1000 houses almost on a private land purchased by the beneficiaries. So this shows they are and this is only 800 to 700 meters away from the high tide line. And so the uh, yesterday we discussed about the acceptable risks and people have accepted the risk and another thing i want to the, the about the preemptive uh, resettlement when uh, in 2013 filing uh, was about to uh, attack odisha on 12th uh, night october 12th night on 11th night the Chief Secretary uh, of Odisha uh, talked to, or MD Osdama, uh, both of them talked to the collector Ganjam about the uh, evacuation of people to cyclone shelters and uh, any uh, uh, appropriate building where the people can be saved who are residing on the seashore, mostly the fisher folk. And uh, on the 11th night, the figure was uh, below 1 lakh. And uh, we have been awarded for 10 lakh population we have shifted. And the chiefs, uh, our uh, managing director who was then our managing director, Mr. Taradat, he uh, talked to uh, the collector Ganjam and uh, told Mr. Collector, I will file an FIR. He, he told that, sir, I am undone. They are not leaving their places. So I cannot do anything now. 11th night, the uh, MD Osdom <coughs> telephoned him and uh, told him that Mr. Corrector, see, tomorrow if anything happens, uh, even a single death occurs, I am the <coughs> I'm going to file an FIR against you as Chief Secretary, against the collector, that this person died because of this collector. He did not take any initiative to shift him. And you can never imagine 
from 11th night to 12th morning the evacuation occurred with uh, disaster management act utilization that people can be evacuated by force that was applied on gone point 9 lakh people were shifted within 4 5 hours that was the risk taking capability or risk accept accepting capability of the people on the seashore and we are here analyzing the how people will be um, uh, out of the risks and uh, I think uh, yesterday we thought of this acceptable risk and uh, more or less that is true. Thank you. Thanks. Very interesting. Any other quick comments? So I'll just quickly sort of, this is a very interesting point to, to end that. The challenge of course for us is, uh, this is one of the most remarkable uh, evacuations. In some cases under gunpoint, some cases because people were mobilized politically, etc. The challenge I think that, that we're having is, uh, how many times can you do this? And eventually after a point of time, people will physically have to and move. That's why ODL. Exactly. Possible exactly. impossibility, zero casualty. Yeah, exactly. So, you know. In, in, in the medium run, uh, in some locations, and as I said, that's why the climate question is a larger thing, it's looming over, but it's over a 20 or 30 time, time, time frame. Uh, how does one actually not only take people out of the immediate risk of loss of life, but the thing that they're concerned about for 80 years or 70 years of their life, and that is that they will not have a livelihood, uh, the assets that they have will not be able to supply. So, th those are the larger, the linkage between the everyday and the stuff that happens every season, which we know is going to happen. Uh, too much rain, flooding in some cases, etc., 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 versus uh, you know the change of thing. And I think that, that that's one thing that today we've gone over. An, uh, I think a number of interesting ideas. One in terms of what we can do about it. It's one thing to say there's a problem. The question is how do we build on that? One thing that that would be quite helpful is just the visualization of process. From one people can understand it, it becomes obvious. This can, this can be included in the plan, which is absolutely that will happen in, uh, within ten years. Absolutely. So, one is a plan within government, but what I am saying even more than that is, if people are going to visualize the impact of what's, what's going to happen, they will themselves start moving. Not all of them, but some of them. So, the ability of people to visualize what's happening. And for that, uh, today thankfully we have better technology, we have better understanding of why community based processes are important. Earlier government was very resistant to this, now we know it has to work hand in hand. Because you know the collector is going to lose his job, so so will some people lose their life. So it becomes a it becomes a you know a common thing. So but the ability to visualize that now because it's very simple. You know people have they have a handset now. A lot of young people have handsets. Yeah. So that itself changes the nature of what's happening. It was like you know when these people in Orissa, people were saying what happened. God told somebody it came on the internet. And that's how we found out. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> and how did it come on the internet? Because there were some radars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how the information goes through, how that's in, in sort of the, it, so, so so I think one thing is just visualization, and for that, apart from all these fancy scientific methods, very very simple things in songs, in stories, these things get internalized as part of popular culture, and and eventually that's how uh, this thing goes down from generation to, to generation. We've seen so many events that have been repeated in the same location. The same mistakes we made again and again, and people are aware of it, but it's not been internalized into the popular culture. So you know that that's sort of one thing that's there. The second thing is uh, the, the the question of you know institutionalization, and institutionalization doesn't only mean government. There are a whole range of other institutions that can enable this kind of process, and village and community-based processes is a very very important part of institutionalization. Andhra started it. Orissa, after 20 years, has started to lead on that. Bangladesh has been doing it for 20 years. I'm talking about this kind of stuff. Sometimes, of course, institutionalization is blocked because of a whole range of interests that are there. It's not in, in, in the advantage of people who want to grab land to let the process get institutionalized. It's very simple and straightforward. The other idea that we heard about today was the fact that especially poor and vulnerable people or even middle class people in some cases become the instruments of the city expanding itself. Fine. They move from one location to the other. So you will find many people uh, when you do their family histories, some of them have been evicted or they've been resettled, etc. But those stories are not told very often. What is told is there's a disaster happening somewhere, so you're responding to that immediate thing instead of seeing that it's an ongoing protest process. So that's you know the other question that I think came up qu quite well today. Uh, the question of actually re reworking our land records, uh, because in the land records uh, is 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 a lot of not only history 
but a response in terms of how the markets will function, who will buy what. So if, if, if you're getting a land record which says, look, this place is going to be flooded on every 30 years, you'll think a little bit about it. So if you're being very opportunistic, if you're a poor or a rich person, good for you. You think you can build the dike or raise a plinth or whatever it is, but many people will think about that. So the land record system, I think, is, is, is pretty important to try and uh, sort of re rework stuff. And then, of course, planning processes. The challenge is, uh, it's nice to say it, but to be able to work planning from the village level upwards or even from, you know, from the city level downwards is not an easy thing to do. It's very, very tough. And we're talking about multidimensional planning here across different sectors and across multiple risks. Because when you're looking at the uh, alignment of a road or a drain, it has an impact on irrigation, it has an impact on drainage, it has an impact on access. And our, we, we are not, it's very difficult for us to do that because most of our stuff is actually siloed. So uh, part of the challenge there, that's why many of us are here, is you don't actually have people, and you must be fine facing this, who can actually do this integration, who can actually pick up these pieces of work, work with the community, and pull all of this stuff together. And as soon as you find them, they either get transferred somewhere else or the World Bank picks them up and they're no longer available where they're required, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is in the, in the local institutions. So that's, that's the other op uh, you know, operational challenge we have. And, and finally, I think the categories that we have, how we define what is risk or opportunity, what is resettlement, how the processes actually play themselves out, whether it's in the old revenue codes which dealt with, uh, you know, with drought or, you know. Last few years, uh, NDMA and other state government organizations are uh, stressing on the uh, coping mechanism of uh, facing the disasters. Yes. By mock drills, uh, everything, that people should be capacitated against eventually. Absolutely, so absolutely. So that is the scene of the day now. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one should not think about resettlement now. So, uh, coping mechanism is much better than any type of resettlement in the rural area. But what I'm saying is that the coping mechanism will help you with the risk that will emerge today, which is an extensive, uh, which is an intensive event. It will not help you with the structural problem of the fact that there is an endemic drought in one part of Telangana, or some area is going to be continually flooded out year after year, and it's impossible to live there. Actually. There are a lot of people in this country who are living in places where they shouldn't be living in because they have no other choice. And the mock drill will help you today when you are getting flooded out. But for example, if you build a state capital, I won't mention the state, in a location that you know is hazard prone because of earthquakes and of flooding, then you are asking for a serious problem uh, to, to emerge. It will happen. And the challenge that we were talking about is accountability for that thing does not reside with either somebody in the government or even the political process because the outcome will be seen too far away and we have to bring that outcome so that it actually you know that feedback process actually happens and part of that will be political I mean suppose the kind of thing that happens in Bombay that big flood that we had and more recently you had an event that say if it starts happening year after year and the kind of degradation of capacity that we've seen in other places we were talking about Kashmir just now I mean you know we worked I was there last year in the valley and stuff like that happens then people will say, forget it, you know, you have to change the system. It will become a political question. Like it has been become in terms of the movements, and Chingur is a classic example of that. People will say, forget it, this is over. And, and that brought about a regime change. You know, entire government that was there for 27 years was thrown out, starting from that small little Chingari that was there. So what I'm saying is that this linkage between the short and the medium run uh, and the long run is something that is not easy to do. It, I don't think we have too many good examples of, of this happening in, in too many places. But we have to think about that and start to implement it. And the difficult part of implementation is whether you're in, you're in the government and you're in the most vulnerable communities. Both those are, th you know, for people who are away from it, like us sitting here, it sounds very nice to talk about it. But when you're on the forefront of that process, it's damn tough. And if you don't prepare for it, then you'll always be in the fire. So anyway, I think we're sort of five minutes out of time. We want to do some closing things or? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, uh, this was extremely, uh, exciting discussion. I think I was just sitting in the corner and vehemently nodding on all these uh, new points. I mean, I never thought after two days of such discussion, we would still have new things that would come up in this. And I think it's, it was a really fantastic uh, spread of uh, issues that we brought up from land to politics to uh, uh, deeply seated sort of uh, uh, emotions that people have 
uh, where they live and um, and work. Um, so I think I'll I'll uh, just uh, thank all the panelists for uh, taking that uh, you know energy onto this uh, uh, forum and all of you who uh, asked questions and of course uh, are going to take uh, a bit from here and, and constantly uh, think about these questions uh, from here. Uh, we have a, a, a website where all the sort of uh, outputs from various reports related to this work are available online. Uh, we've taken your uh, contacts just now, so we'll try and uh, send that out in case you, are, you all are interested. There's also a photo exhibition that's right next, uh, right next door. Uh, in case any of you are interested, uh, we'll be around uh, to tell more about that. Uh, thank you so much here, as well as uh, all those who are watching us on the live stream. Uh, thanks a lot.